Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're prepared to close. Is that be the position of the chairman? The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. And how much and time has do I have, Mr. Speaker? Three and three quarter minutes remaining. Thank you. So I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your impeccable fairness once again as you've presided over this chamber, as usual. And I want to call attention to the argument I made at the outset as to how we got to where we are today. This is a manageable issue that men and women of good sense and good instinct could come together to find a solution. The debt to GDP ratio, I understand the argument. But does that take into consideration a pandemic, aid to Ukraine, stopping the hostility of Putin's aggression, back to our obligation for those who voted for the PATH Act here to come to the aid of our veterans? How about the infrastructure bill that Republicans, some of whom voted for? How about the CHIPS Act, some of whom these Republicans voted for? How about the extraordinary increases in defense spending as China threatens America in the Straits of Taiwan, South China Seas? These are all parts of votes that both parties have cast. These are parts of the obligations that we have to members of the American family. So they suggest, well, if we just chop Medicaid, and you know, earlier today, Mr. Speaker, it should be noted, this exclamation point that they've added to the argument that we have no intention of cutting Social Security or Medicare. Great, that's nice to hear. But there are members of the Republican leadership in the Senate who have said precisely the opposite, and they would put Medicare and Social Security on the chopping block. And our side should not be restrained by calling attention to that, despite the debate that takes place in this chamber. So the spending challenges that we have as they relate to defense, where every Republican voted, I believe, for that defense budget, and the substantial increases that have taken place, that has been an act of responsibility based upon what happens with Putin and President Xi and others who would threaten freedom across the globe. When we look at this argument that has been presented to the American people today, I want to ask you about their 401k plans as they allow this argument to be pursued. The markets are going to begin to reflect this in coming days when people are going to pull back from investment. People are going to pull back from what ordinarily would be an act of good fiscal prudence. And people are going to begin to pay a great deal of attention to this. And the argument that Democrats have offered today is really simple. You and us, we were responsible for these increases in spending. Let's have a vote on a clean debt resolution here, and then proceed to negotiation and discussion. I've heard this argument when former President Bush never vetoed one spending bill during eight years as president. I've seen this argument when we cut taxes without the help of us by $1.3 trillion in 2001. And by the way, another trillion in 2003 with the subsequent invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan and a million and a half new veterans. These are our obligations. Even though we disagreed by and large with those positions that were adopted by the then majority, you recognize the reality that the tally and the credit card is in front of us. When you get the credit card, you don't get to say, well, I don't like the part of the bill that I've run up here, so I'm not going to pay it. Or you don't say, I'll only pay this. The bill is in front of us. The full faith and credit of the United States is in front of us. I made reference earlier today to the fiscal probity of the Republican Party when I first came here. Whatever happened to the Republican Party when it relates to fiscal prudence and probity? We pay our bills, and we don't threaten the currency of the United States where that dollar is recognized everywhere across the globe. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, you